Praise the Lord. Look up this way and smile, okay? Good, thank you. Last Tuesday, we had uh, Larry's memorial service, and the church was completely full. We had over 160 people here. I really liked that. You know, I, I could get used to that, I think. I'm, I'm totally in favor of filling the church up. Would you do something for me? How many can come back next Sunday? And the Sunday after? If you can make it the Sunday after, let's make it a goal on the 18th. Let's see if we can fill the church up. That's the Sunday of our Christmas program. So you can invite your friends and people that are not used to normal church service. Have them come because we're nothing normal about us. So have, a, have them come. And on the 18th, now next Sunday, you can invite them as just a practice run. They probably won't come the first time you invite them. So invite them as a practice run. If they come, you'll be surprised. But the following Sunday, we want to fill the place up, okay? Let's just do that just, just for fun. See if we can't, we might not get to where we like it. And then we do it every Sunday. Good. Had the most unusual thing happen to me Friday. I, uh, it was a scriptural thing that happened, but uh, it was unusual for me because um, my wife, as you know, has a ministry to people that are in, are in jail or in prison, and that's kind of unusual because she's not been there a lot, of, a lot in her life, but uh, she's been going there and ministering to people and uh, writing letters, and as many of you know, there's been people that have gotten saved and gone on into rehab and gone on to their lives and good things are happening in their lives because of this ministry. Well, she asked me, she said, Gary, would you uh, come with me up to Mission, R Mission Creek, which is a, a ladies' uh, medium security prison for people that are, have, that are there for a long, long time. And she said, would you come up and with me? And uh, I said, no, that's not my ministry. I'll be honest. I said, no, that, that's not my ministry. I, I don't really want to do that. And she said, well, um, that's, the thing is, if I go and see a lady in there, I can only see one person in the prison system in all of Washington. So as long as I'm visiting one person in a prison someplace in Washington, I can't go to any other prison in the state of Washington and visit anyone else. Interesting rule, huh? I thought she was mistaken, so I went and asked the guard while I was there. They said, that's definitely a rule. No, you cannot go... You cannot visit someone at Stafford Creek and also someone at Mission Creek. You can't do that. If you're visiting one, that's it. Interesting rule. Anyway, she said there's another woman up here who's just given her heart to the Lord, gotten things right with God, and she wants a pastor to come and visit her. Would, would you come under those circumstances? A little harder to say no, Will. So I said, okay, I'll go. I went there. We went in and sat down, and guards everywhere and people sitting there and I was only allowed to talk to the person that I came to talk to I couldn't talk to the person behind me even though Carmen was sitting there talking to the lady that was with her couldn't talk to that one that isn't always the case because I've gone to other I've been at McNeil and that wasn't the case but here it was and so I talked to this young lady and we had an interesting conversation and in the conversation she said why would you come how far did you come and I said maybe 120 miles. She said, why would you drive 120 miles to talk to me? You don't even know me. And I said, yeah. I said, do you want to know the reason? And I, she said, yes. I said, well, the Bible said that at the, at the judgment time, Jesus is going to say, I was hungry and you fed me. I was all these things. I was in prison and you visited me. And then he said, and we would say, when did you visit me? And, you, and he would say, when you did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And I said, that's why I'm here. And she said, I knew the Bible said that before I came here, and I never went to visit anybody in jail. <laughs> I said, well, and I, I think I said something like, you probably will when you get out. The thing is, folks, there's, a, there's ministries that we don't know about. You have a captive audience at a place like that. I've never known anybody to be stood up. When you go to jail, they'll come and talk to you. And because they don't have any, she has been there for 16 months. She's been visited, I think she said, four times in 16 months. She has five children. 
and uh, 41 years old. She was a nurse at Providence Hospital, and her life went awry. She ended up in prison for four years. I could say that it could happen to anyone. I don't know that it could, but it certainly happened to her. And she sat there with tears running down her face and said, I haven't seen my five children for 16 months. She said, oh, I take that back. They did come and visit her a couple of times. They were one of the four or a couple of the four visits that she had. Friends, when you're thinking about something, and I know you say, well, pastor, that takes me outside my comfort zone. It did me. Um, you say, well, I, I don't know that that would be my ministry. Maybe it's not. But if you're looking for a ministry and you don't have one, and you're looking for somebody to reach out to, and you've fed the hungry and done all those things, then look at the possibility of talking to somebody behind bars, telling them about Jesus. You have the best gift you could ever give them. You can give them freedom, and you can give them eternal life by just going and telling them about Jesus. Consider that. That has nothing to do with Colossians, the first chapter. I'm going to go back just a little bit. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. The kingdom of the Son of his love. We're going to be talking about the kingdom of the Son of his love, and we're going to be talking about the, the king today. Because the next verse says, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or governments or the government of the United States or our, or, uh, our governor of our state of Washington. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Is that good scripture or not? That is good scripture. It does bring us to a huge conversation. It brings us to way more than a little simple preacher in this church can talk about. It talks about God the Father, Jesus being the invisible, our being the um, uh, firstborn of all creation, the image of the invisible God. In one of the translations I looked at, it says that Jesus is the exact image of the Father. The exact image of the Father. Our world for many years has created gods and made images. You can go to another country. You can go to China or someplace like that, and you'll see pictures of Buddha. You'll see little stone images of Buddha or, or Confucius or whoever the person happens to be that they're worshiping. And you can see those images, and they place them in a prominent place or they have a God that they worship that's in a prominent place and they put it up there and they worship that God, an image of that God. We worship a God that we've never seen. We worship God the Father who no one has seen except his son. Nobody on earth. We worship a, a heavenly father that we know some about, but we have not seen him. I have not seen, and neither has ear heard, the things that are in store for us. And one of the things that's in store for us is someday we will meet our Savior and Lord, and we will even be in the presence of Almighty God. And we'll see them face to face. That is going to be a glorious day. How many's picture of Jesus is like the picture you see on the wall? When you think of Jesus, he has a little beard, long hair, dressed in uh, light 
light white robe and, and uh, brown hair and everything. Just a picture you see. And when you think of Jesus, you think of that picture. Comes in your head. I don't know that Jesus even looked anything like that. Because I think the person that painted that picture probably hadn't seen Jesus either. But we don't know what Jesus looked like on this earth. We don't know what God looks like in, the, in heaven. But we do know that Jesus, the Bible says, is the exact image of the Father. In Genesis chapter 1, you can turn with me to these places if you want to. It won't hurt you and it'll probably do you good. Genesis number 1, chapter 1. We're going to look at, at a verse here, verses 26 and 27, where it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Before that, it says, God said, let us, uh, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. But God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Who is our? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You agree on that? He made us in his image. Jesus was in the image of the Father. So, when Jesus came to this earth, God came to earth. If anybody disagrees with what I'm saying, you better say so now. Because it's probably going to build on it. Okay. We've been made in the image of God. And, uh, and God... And Jesus share the same image, the same um, characteristics. And so um, I'm going to take a look at something that says uh, John chapter 1. Let's, let's go to John chapter 1. I'm going to lay some groundwork here and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit. But John chapter 1. St. John chapter 1. Reading with verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The Word, of course, being the Lord Jesus Christ. Another name for Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. He was there at the very beginning. He was there before the beginning. Jesus is God. He created everything that we know. Now, when you think about that, we're going to talk about that a little bit as we get down through here, but when you think about that, Jesus created everything that we know. Did you know that he created it, meaning he did it in the past? Now, follow along with me. We're thinking that these things are unfolding, okay? I want you to follow along with me here for a little bit. Can I get ahead of myself and then I'll back up? That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> but that doesn't make any difference. I'm sometimes confused. If you look closely, it says, well, let's read it just so we get it straight. Let's just go on down a little farther. Back in Colossians. For by him all things were created. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power. Now think about that. Did you realize that when God created the earth, he created everything we know? He created it. I know it's science fiction. You guys are going to have to shift a gear here with me, but he created it. It's already been created. The United States has already been created. It's already in place. Okay? It's kind of hard to follow, isn't it? Except for the fact that because God did that, God knows. Now, we're going to help you, Brother Dale. On that subject that we were on last Wednesday night, God knows. If I confused anybody by saying that I believe that God didn't know, forget that. That was a bunch of nonsense, apparently. 
Because as I prayed about it and thought about it this week, God knows. God knows the future. He knows the past. He knows today. He knows your life and my life. He knows that America was going to be at the crossroads it's at right now. He knows that Obama is in office. He knew it back when he created all this. And yet he still did it. Kind of hard to figure, huh? But he did. God created all this, and he knew that principalities and powers and all these things were going to happen. And yet he still created it. Huh. And over all of it, he put the Lord Jesus Christ. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created through him and for him. All things were created through him and for him. Okay, let's, let's go back to John now. Back to John. Only let's go to the 14th chapter now. How can we know God? That's been a question that people have asked. A number of years ago, a person did an experiment. I think it was uh, D.L. Moody or one of his people did an experiment in a large class, a large Sunday school class, gave every student there a piece of paper and said, draw a picture of God. That would be hard. How would you do? Draw a picture of God. Would it look like his son Jesus, a picture we've seen? Would it look like someone we know who exemplifies the Lord Jesus Christ in their life? Would it just be as it was one of the students drew a great big cloud and, and made it purple? I remember reading the story. They colored it purple because they couldn't grasp God. It was a nebulae thing, out, just something that they couldn't get a hold of. I challenge you that many people today do not know God. There may be people here today who do not know God because they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at chapter 14 of John. Jesus said, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it will be sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the uh, sake of the works themselves. Jesus said, I am the Father and I and the Father am one. So if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. For us to have a relationship with God, he knew that we would have to come through his son. Follow along with me. Because a relationship with God is only a relationship with a being that is so awesome and so far above us that we can't relate to it, to hardly relate to God. We have a picture of God as our heavenly father, yes, and God, we know that he does certain things to us, but most people cannot relate to a God somewhere in, vast, in a vast heaven who's created everything we know and, and is just out there. But they can relate to his son, Jesus Christ, who came in the likeness of flesh and dwelt among us and grew up, was born in a manger from a very lowly beginning. We're going to be singing and thinking about that here in a couple of weeks, but Jesus was born in a manger. We can relate to being in a manger or, be, or seeing a manger and being around cattle. And I don't think any of you were born in a manger, but, uh, but we, can, we can relate to a person that was. We can picture a person that grew up on the shores of Galilee, walked and talked with fishermen, 
preached, preached what we found in God's word, got angry and, and ran the money changers out of the temple. He didn't sin, but the Bible says he did get angry. It says that he was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. He was tempted every way like we are, and yet he did not sin. So, if you, if you uh, need to relate to God, or you want to relate with, to God, you relate to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. And through uh, your uh, walk and talk with Jesus. If you know Jesus, you know the Father. Now, if we look, going back again to Colossians, I told Carmen I was going to have a hard time doing this because there's so much here that you could take any one little portion of this and preach two or three sermons. It says that Jesus was the firstborn over all creation. That doesn't mean that he was first created because he wasn't created. It doesn't mean he was first to be born. He was born of a Virgin Mary, but he was, all, was before that. It means that his rank and position is above. It means he's the firstborn. He is an heir. He is the, he is the ultimate heir. He, 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 has, um, he is to be exalted. He is to be number one. So that's why it says that he was firstborn. You say, well, in the Jewish nation, the firstborn was the one that inherited everything. Well, that wasn't the case with Isaac, and it wasn't the case with Jacob. The firstborn is the one that got the rank, and the father, and the father gave to the, the child the privilege and rank of the firstborn. So the firstborn wasn't always the firstborn. If you want to check that out, you can check it out in your Bible. But, uh, but Jesus was not, was not necessarily the firstborn of, um, he was the firstborn of us because salvation came through him, but over all creation, he, he ranks at the very top. Okay, he is before, and I want to get down here, all things were created through him and for him. Now that brings us to an interesting thing. If all things were created through him and for him, how does what's going on in the world benefit what, what God is doing? We look at the world and the turmoil and the chaos and everything that's going on out there in the world, and you say, but God created all that. Did you know, and I'm sure you know this, but um, God's got a timetable that's just clicking off. God's plan is working just the way he planned it from the beginning of time. It's not deviating. God's time, God's plan of redemption, re reconciling man back to himself, that's where we're going to be next Sunday, is reconciling, the reconciliation of Christ, being reconciled in Christ. But, but today, I would just want you to know that God's plan is in, everything's under control, Tony. He hasn't lost control of the earth. Everything is coming together at his time, and there's one of these days, not very soon, when he's going to give a nod to the Lord Jesus Christ and say it's time. And when that happens, the sky is going to split open and Jesus is going to come back in the clouds of glory in God's timing. And he's going to come back for his children that are looking for his, for his appearing. Looking at the next verse, it says, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist, or exist, or hold together. The, the word, when I looked it up, I, in some other translations, it says, he holds everything together. Jesus is holding everything together. Don't panic. It's not falling apart. Sometimes our world falls apart when we take it out of his hands. But if we leave our world in his hands, if we, if we put our lives in his hands, it doesn't fall apart. It may go the way he directed it, but it didn't fall apart. I said, Lord, help me in, the, help me in this sermon to bring something that will relate to us. Because for me to talk about a great big God out there in space... And a great creator, 
The world knows that, or they don't admit it, but they should know it. I want to talk about something that makes a difference to, to you, right where you're sitting. So I want to take you to the next thing. In him, all things are held together, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. We looked at who God the Father is. Now for a moment, would you turn with me over to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And we're going to relate to a creator God through his exact image on this earth, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for what he came for. Hebrews chapter 4. God the Father looked upon his creation and realized before that he knew that anyway. I've already said he knew all this before ahead of time. But his creation had back, had had gone the other way, left God. Mankind had done its own things. And Jesus was Jesus came to the earth as verse 14, chapter 4 of Hebrews. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of God's love, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may, may obtain mercy, find grace to help in a time of need. So God the Father, that is a hard thing, a hard person for us to comprehend, get a picture of, came in the likeness of his son, died in our place as as the sinless Son of God, the sinless Lamb of God, and now we have a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Not a high priest that we can't go and talk to. One that cares about Quinault, cares about you right where you're sitting, knows you, loves you, listens to you, answers your prayers, cares about you every day. You know what? If you, I don't know why I'm going to say this. I'm just going to say this. If you've got bitterness or hardness in your heart or anger towards someone or maybe you're just, maybe somebody's hurt you and they're hurt so deep. Do you know that Jesus knows about that? And he loves you in spite of the fact that that's there. Maybe I'm saying this some for me and some for you. But God knows right where you live and he knows right what's in your heart. Even if you don't say, Jesus, this is in my heart. I just want to tell you about it. He knows it's there. He'd like to have you talk it over with him because he'd like to take it away. Maybe you've been disappointed to the max and you're afraid to trust. You're afraid to reach out and trust again. You just say, I can't do that. I'm not going to put myself in that spot. I'm not going to love again. I'm not going to trust again. You know what? God knows that. He knows that about you. And he, he can help you through that. He loves you so much, he'll, he'll take you by the hand. Maybe even put his arm around you and say, let's walk through this together. I'll just go back to the fact that Sometimes, if you get hurt bad enough or disappointed bad enough, human nature builds a wall. Builds a wall there. You don't want to talk to God about it. You'd rather just ignore it, wish it would go away. But whenever it comes your way, it builds a bigger wall and gets and your heart your heart gets your heart gets hard. You don't want to deal with that thing. And this morning, God wants you to know that that's one of the reasons He died was to give you to show you the love and forgiveness to get past that. How many of you know if you pray for somebody, you can't hate them? 
If you pray for somebody for a length of time, you'll get over hating them. They may not become your best friend, but you won't hate them. Sometimes you have to pray for somebody. You have to just say, Lord, I don't know how, but I'm going to love that person with the love of Christ. Now, what makes it really hard is what if you're in a situation where it continues? Where it continues. As I was talking to the young woman I went to see in the jail, 41 years old, she said, I'm full of bitterness and hatred. She said, I don't want to, but I am. She said, my husband decided not to divorce me, decided not to physically hurt me, but mentally he abused me day after day. And he loaded, when I told him I was suicide, he loaded my gun and put it beside my bed. And he bought pill after pill after pill and kept full bottles beside my bed so I could commit suicide. She said, I have gotten so full of hatred and bitterness, I can't hardly seem to lay it down. It's only been the last few weeks that I've even, been, even tried to deal with it. And she said, there were tears running down her face and said, I don't know how to deal with this. She said, because I took that gun. <laughs> I took that gun and said, I'm going to shoot you with it. And she said, he called, the, called 911 and she just held the gun until he got done and then he came over and took the gun away from her. It went off. Reckless endangerment of the children because they were in the home. It went off in the air. But reckless endangerment of the children, assault with a deadly weapon. And she had four years. She went from being a charge nurse in a hospital, very sad, thinking she was losing her mind, went from being that to the next day in jail, the next day in prison. And, huh? And he walked away, yeah. And she said, that even makes it harder because he walked away with, the four, with four out of the five kids. And she, and she said, it's so hard not to be bitter and angry and hate that man. And he continues to turn my children against me. You know what? I can say all the fancy things that preachers know how to say. But you let somebody like that sit there, look you in the eye with tears running down her face, and say, I don't know what to do. You know what? All the fancy words, all the cliches mean nothing at a time like that. You know what makes a difference? Is to put your hand on top of their hand and say, I can't give you the answer to that, but Jesus can. Let's talk to him about it. Jesus is the only one that can give you the forgiveness to let go of that person that hurt you, and we'll come back here to, to, to this now, of that person that hurt you so deeply, that person that dis disappointed you so much, that person that took so much away from you, only God can give you the grace and the love and the ability to forgive. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Jesus, we're thankful that you are a, a loving God, and that you are a heavenly Father that that uh, sent your Son in our light, in your image, but sent your Son to be here with us that so we can relate. And Lord, that He also came as a High Priest that continually lives to make intercession for us. And He was at point, He went through everything that we've gone through, yet He didn't sin. He was disappointed. He was discouraged. He was, uh, people took things away from him. He, had, he was treated badly, and yet he never sinned. Lord, I can't say that in my life because I've let, sometimes I've let bitterness or anger or, or any of those things build up in my life. And Lord, I believe that's true of lots of us here. This morning, Lord, we can't even lay those things down unless you help us. We can't climb over these things on our own. The harder we try, the bigger they get. This morning, we need to just lay them at your feet and say, Jesus, would you help me through that? This morning, I just would say, 
if you want to. You'd like to come down here and kneel at the altar or one of these front seats here or even where you are. Just take a little while and say, Jesus, I can't fix it by myself, but you can help me. This will be the morning to do that. <coughs> I can't fix it by myself. It's too big for me. I don't have the answers. Anybody else want to come down and just pray your way through it? You'll get up and you'll take it home with you. But Jesus will go with you to help you through tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. I will say one thing. If you're here and you've got those things in your heart, you choose to get up and leave. You choose not to ask for God's help or maybe you just say, well, I don't want to get home or whatever. Chances are you won't. And chances are you won't get victory. But you can get victory if you choose to today. Because if you come down here, we'll pray with you. We'll believe God for some miracles. Put these things behind us, away from us. Get them forgiven, taken care of. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.